Welcome back. This is Kevin McCain with Idaho Horror Classes and Kevin McCain Studios. Uh, we're going to be doing some watercolor over here. Um, in terms of the brushes I'm using, we got a 10. Probably got a. What do we got over here? This is a. This is an eight. I thought it was going to be a five. And this is a number six round. This is just another number 10. This has a better tip than that one. So you got a one inch and a half inch. And I swear this is a. What are they calling this a three quarter? I don't know. Yeah, okay, so three quarter and a half. And uh, we're going to be doing this painting here. And we're going to do a painting where we're going to use um, glazing and we're going to glaze complementary colors down. So this is kind of fun. So if this is white tablecloth, we're not, we're not going to glaze much under there because it's so light that you know, you're just not going to do that. Um, if I've got a, a uh, we have a, a wall here, and the wall is supposed to be um, like a, a a very neutral sort of orange, light orange, uh, for the for the, for the wall, and so we might go. What's the complement of that? Well, that might be blue, and so uh, we would then go. Okay, well I'm going to use blue. Now there's sometimes we're be doing a yellow pair. And the compliments are, uh, I was going to use, uh, I'm going to use, I was going to use violet for the shadows, but then we're already doing yellow because it's a pair. So what we're going to do is for the the pair, we're going to make it a purple and a yellow orange. That bit of yellow orange will make it warmer. The purple will make it cooler. I want to show you how to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and I was just getting some of the. There was a lot of green in here from whatever was used before. And let's start with the background. I'm just going to go ahead and take a wash. Uh, now I have to. Re I'm going to. I'm, I want to. I want a color that is going to be um, more of a. Usually, dye colors are better. This is cerulean um, and uh, blue, and this is thalo blue. Well, thalo blue is the the dye color of the two. So, if I was going to use uh, the color that I would use, would be the the thalo because I don't want this would pick up if I use the the uh, Cerulean, it just won't, it doesn't have the staining power, it just is not a staining color. And I'm going to use this very, very lightly. And we're going to come in here. Again, we're going to glaze down the wall with essential, which is going to be its complement. So this is a way, and then you're going to glaze over with the orange, and you're actually going to have to make sure that the orange that you use is a little brighter because you've already got its complement down there. So they're going to gray down a little bit. Um, this is another way of um, dealing with color mixing where instead of mixing the orange and the blue together you'll get a slightly duller mixture by keeping them separate and glazing them you'll get a slightly deeper color but remember it's also you know it's, it's gonna go darker too so that's why I'm starting off with this very very light blue color and, and of course this wall is not that dark either so I have to make sure that what we're using is going to be fairly light. Now this is going to be a much simpler demonstration and that's why I'm using the pair. It's just to give you an idea of this as opposed to uh, I did one where we did like flowers and stuff and did a little bit of underpainting in that one. Um, and so that we're, that's what's, that is what we're going to do here is we're going to say alright we're going to go ahead and Again, we're, we're, we're doing some underpainting, as we call it. And let's get this a little lighter. Well, that's not what I wanted. Thank goodness it's light. Go ahead and lighten this up a little bit and put this in the background. Okay. So we're going to use this concept, but for those in the class, I'm going to send you a little still life uh, where you're going to try to use this concept because we've We've done a few of these sort of glazing underneath. Um, this is just a variation of it. We're going to come back to this when we've got this is dried out. So I'm going to set this aside. We're going to come back and then we'll start uh, to put the the violets in the shadows and the, the oranges in the lights for the pair. All right, welcome back. So 
Again, I had forgotten to turn the photographic lights on, so this will have a little different temperature, but that's okay. So what we're going to do now on this is we're going to uh, glaze the shadow side with violet. Now, if I if I glaze over this with yellow, we have to we have to make some decisions here because if it's if it's too much of a blue, if it's if it's true violet or even a blue violet, it's going to go very green. So we have to start to decide how you know how violet do we want it to be. Um, and of course, it's going to depend on what we glaze over with too. But let's just say let's let's go ahead and air just a little bit on the warmer side of violet. So it doesn't go too green. It's going to go a little green, but we, we're going to try to mitigate. I just got some blue in there. Wrong blue. My brush kind of jumped on over there. All right. So yeah, I think that'll be a little too, I'll put a little more of the red in here. This right now is about true violet. And then we're going to just a tiny bit more red than that. So it's still pretty close to true violet. We want, we want it to be lighter than the, the darks in this because uh, if it's too dark, well then again, it, it, it'll take over the color. So we're going to start off by putting down the, the uh, shape of the shadow that we've got. Now when we do this we again we have to hurry. We've only got about 10 minutes before this is going to be unworkable. So again, we're going to have a little violet in here. Um, poor shadow. We're not going to go through all the different, because I don't want to go that dark. So we're going to err on the side of the dark tones and the reflected light. So reflect the light up through there reflected light through here and a little bit of reflected light there okay so then on this side now again I've, I've left this too long but on this side we're going to use a little bit of yellow orange as uh, the under the the undertone for this part of our pair So again, we're using, again, the complementary colors as we are There's a highlight around and through here a little bit. And then there's a highlight up here. So we want to just give that a nod. So we did one where we glazed with, um, where I glazed with brown and Payne's gray to deal with warm and cool. And this is very similar, except we're really pushing that warm and cool relationship on this one it's it's you know it's because we're using brighter color and so it's going to have a much more substantial effect on our painting 
So again, I can go ahead and bring a little bit more of this into here. And again, we got to be careful. We don't want to get this too dark. This needs to be light enough that I can glaze uh, with my other color and it won't have too much of a problem. All right. So I want to come in here just a little bit more, uh, try to integrate the color as it transitions just a bit more into this into this purple just so again that we it looks like it's going to be transitioning from the from the yellow orange into the purple into the violet and this will help a bit where as that goes Okay. All right. Okay, so once we've done that, again, we're going to put this aside, let it dry. So we're going to come back and we're going to then, you know, deal with the pair, deal with the background. Um, and we'll go from there. All right, we're back. So I went in and stretched this out because it just wasn't, it was just buckling way too much. Um, and I think we've got this thing. It may not be completely dry just yet, but it's dry enough to work on. Uh, I got this pretty wet. This is pretty heavy paper. When it dries it'll probably curl this thing up like this a little bit. So what we're going to do is again we've got this glazed with the with the purple and the yellow orange. We're then going to mix out our colors so we're going to go ahead and mix out and I want at least uh, at least four, but I'm probably going to mix a few more on this. Um, there's uh, now there's an apple to the right of this guy, which is probably why he's getting so warm on the end, just because we're getting some reflected color. But I'm gonna I still like the fact that we're getting some some shift in the color a little bit, so I like that. We're gonna go ahead and keep that. Uh, we're then gonna go into our middle value, so we're gonna use a little yellow and a little darken the yellow with a little bit of the of the burnt umber okay and then we're going to go into the shadows and we're going to darken this uh, again once it gets to a certain point with yellow we have to darken it with um, now I've got sap green which is yellow green and I've got burnt umber which is an orange and if you look on the color wheel uh, between yellow and orange it'll cross the yellow spectrum now it won't be bright yellow like these it'll be a yellow like this so this is a darker yellow okay that'll be for the shadow and then we're going to bring in one that's again slightly cooler i might even use just a touch of this blue right here um over this i also have to keep in mind the purple because some of that purple is going to shine through so we're going to go ahead and can darken this yellow a little bit more all right and then we're going to start to paint this so I'm going to start with what this starts to turn into middle value on the edge uh, well I guess we'll give a nod to this gets a little darker and a little more golden up here. This is a, a faux painted pear, so it's not a real pear, but it's it, it, it's been painted re rather well. And so it has this sort of this darker uh, bit going on up here that I just want to give a nod to. We're not, uh, I would actually go more into that by glazing it and, you know, in further layers to build that up. But for right now, I just want to give it again a nod. I want to say, hey, it's there. 
and so we don't want to ignore it. Uh, we're then going to go ahead and start to bring in the uh, the colors of the pair where we're also wetting this down so we can get these you know this right here is our middle values and again some of that orange is going to shine through as we're putting some of this in here uh, which is what we want we wanted some of that to happen so we're getting some of that that's that's the good news uh, for this where this is working uh, and it's it's again it's a lovely way of working this is everyone you know kind of figures their their way of the different ways to work in watercolor uh, this is a very common one using complementary color and then when you come over the color it's going to again still some of that color shines through and it helps influence you know how the the, the pair will look at in the end and that's that's a, that's a nice thing that's 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 the good stuff we want that to happen so again we're going ahead and Okay. We're going to go ahead and darken this down, right? We're also going to come through here for the, uh, you know, for the shadows. We need the shadows in here as well. And we don't have hardly anything in there yet. So we're going to go ahead and glaze over some of that purple. And the purple is going to mix with the yellow. It's going to keep it cooler. And again, the whole point of this is to be able to do some warm, you know, a little bit better job with the warm and the cool. Um... Let's change brushes here because we're going to need to get up here into this where we got a little bit more of a smaller space. So again, if I have to change brushes, no big deal. Better to have a little more control than less control. And I can come over here and double check if I've got this contour good and clean, which again we want. We want a nice clean contour. Coming on into here. Like so. Now again, I could I th find out, um, I think this is probably still wet enough that we can work in here. Again, remember the whole rule of if it's the color I want when it's wet, it won't be the color I want when it's dry.
So I'm just trying to vary the color through here a little bit. Basically drop it in color and letting it bleed out just a, just a bit. Just a scotch, just a smidgen. Um, again, by doing this, we're going to have a little bit more color variation because of the fact we, we glaze underneath there. I'm still trying to put a little bit more blue in here to give it just a little bit more of that color variation. It's going to really help in the, when this watercolor dries to have some of that. Um, I think we've gone as far as I can in this layer. Again, we can always come over here and again glaze it again. So, but at least we've got, you know, some of this established. Core shadow, reflected light, dark tones, highlight, some middle values, some lighter values, but these are pretty close. This is almost one value and highlight. So we'll come in there once it's dry. We'll come back and we'll get into this a little bit more. All right, so we're back with our painting of the pear where we're glazing underneath in complementary colors. So this has a light brown wash where I'm actually going to put a blue-gray wash later on. This is for a wall that's sort of an ivory color, so it has like a blue-green turquoise sort of color. And in fact, why don't we glaze that right now? And so I'm going to go ahead and come over here. I'm going to start with the yellow. And then we're going to dull that yellow down so it's not too bright. So I'm going to, I could do one of two ways. I could either, since this is for intermediate watercolor, uh, we can go ahead and use a different way. We can actually come in here with a little bit of purple using complementary mixtures. And we can do that too to, again, dull something down. Now if we have to darken something, again, we're probably going to have to be bringing in Payne's Gray and some darker colors. But for what we're doing right now, it's, it's not a big thing. Uh, we also have, again, the complementary color down here as well. I'm going to add just a little bit of this for my blue. I think that one went a little bit too blue. We're going to bring a little bit more of some yellow back here. Um, I should have some tester strips over here, but in, in case you don't, you can use your paper towel to check what that color will look like when it's actually down on the paper. Now it's going to change a little bit because of this underpainting of blue-green. So we're going to go ahead and put down the a wash. Cut it around the pear. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my round because it'll do a little. It'll be a little easier, a little easier dexterity than with that large brush. Okay. And then just a little bit of a white line right there. All right, continue on before this starts to create a water line. We're going to go ahead and continue to paint. All right. I grab a little bit more, grab a little bit of the yellow, a little bit of this, a little bit of the violet. A little of this. Go ahead, maybe a little more yellow because we lost some of the yellow. Some of this, some of that, some of that, some of that. Um, now with watercolor, we should be careful. You don't want to mix more than. Usually, you want to stay away from mixing more than three or four colors uh, in general, and that's not always, but in general, that can that can help you avoid mixtures that are going too dull, too neutral. 
though right now we're looking for a neutral mixture. So take this out, grab this other brush, take this other brush, and we're going to use it to, again, trim around this area right here. Extend this out just a bit so it doesn't create a water line. Come around the stem this way. Like so. All right, grab the brush back again. Because again, we have to work very, very quickly. Okay. Now as we're coming over here, now some of this, um, let's see if this is still wet enough, thank goodness. Because uh, I'm taking more time than I normally would want to. Darken this up just a bit. To come over here, we want to get a little warmer. So we're going to take a little bit more. We're going to take a little bit of orange, mix it into here, lighten this up. And again, we've got to make this sure that doesn't create a water line just yet. So again, we're trying to make this a little warmer. You know, show that there's a little more light over here as we're painting this on here. It's got a little bit, slightly richer yellow, slightly richer red, just a bit. All right, so this is, we, we've wet the, the entire background right through here. Um, as far as that goes, kind of all went past my I established a little line here but that's all right if you're gonna put a mat on it it's not gonna be that big a deal but I think we could go ahead and see if we've got still just enough time looks like this has really started to sink in very quickly over here so we don't have a whole lot of time but this is uh, there's very little moisture over here so this is really sort of like a semi wet brush instead of a wet brush uh, so again we can Try to add just a little bit more paint so we have a little bit more. I just I just dab this a little bit into the water so we have just a tiny bit more water. But we're trying to uh, get a little bit more of a gradation with our paint, which would be desirable. Wouldn't be a bad thing to be sure. Um, so, got a little bit of that. The wall comes down here. We're gonna darken this just a bit, like so. This should be darker on this side, which I don't think it is just yet. Bring a little more of the blue in here, a little of the red, a little bit of the purple. A purple, <laughs> yellow to the purple. A uh, little red, a little blue for the purple. A little yellow to neutralize that. And again, we can bring this in right here and see if we can just darken just a little bit more. Something about like that. Now, I just realized I um, probably need to come over here and be just a little bit more delicate with this. And there's a couple places I missed, so now's the time to come in here. And try to uh, clean this up just a just a bit. Now sometimes um, people will use a bridge, which is a piece of wood with two. Um, piece of wood underneath it on either side to raise it up off the up off the painting and then you can much more easily I'm make a, this a thirsty brush you can much more easily then reach into areas it's kind of like a mall stick that oil painters would use but and you could certainly try to use a mall stick on this but uh, other people will use what's a bridge like you would use in like a drawing or something and it just it, it creates a little little bridge 
over the wet part and you can then put your hand on the on the bridge and manipulate a little bit more of the the painting by using that bridge kind of cool stuff so again we went ahead and we've now laid in that background we can also come in here into the cast shadow because you know we don't the cast shadow isn't laid in yet and so we can start now I could you know in the beginning class we were using puddles of dark medium and light and this would not be a bad time to that's always a good practice sometimes you'll get going and I've certainly been, you've seen me do this, where I just like, oh, I'm, I'm throwing what I normally do out the window. I need to crank it up. And uh, in these real-time videos, uh, I certainly will do that because I don't want to be here for four hours, boring you guys to tears. And so, but we've got a dark, medium, and a light mixture here for my paint. Um, and then we're going to come in here and we're going to address the cast shadow okay and again it's glazed with a light burnt umber which is a dark 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 orange now we lighten it up but there's an orange undertone because that's what that color is and now we're coming over it with this Payne's gray and because there's orange underneath the blue the blue will actually stand out more so this is a complementary color. It's similar to the, the the rudimentary fundamentals of this is you know anchored in impressionism, but or what we think of as impressionists because we always think of uh, complementary colors. But this concept goes back to at least the Renaissance and probably even further than that. And that is you know when they were doing murals and things, they would if they were gonna you know, paint people, you know, fleshy, pink, uh, you know, sort of stuff, and they didn't have very great, they didn't have a lot of great color, so they had to have it, make it look like they had more color than they actually had. And the way they'd do it is they would, use, they would like glaze a face with green and then come over it with, you know, basically mixtures of white and, and uh, Venetian reds and things like that and ochres and things. But it would make the pinks look brighter because they were going over a ground that was the complementary color. So people were thinking about complementary color long before the Impressionists. It's just that they were working with more earthy sorts of colors, but they were still using the concepts. You know, even in their painting and 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 changing hues and things, artists have always done that. So it's not like the Impressionists came up with that idea. It's just they had paint where they could push it to a further degree than ever had been pushed before. And that's what, you know, made them really stand out. That and their very direct brushwork. Because other people were doing layers and layers, kind of like we do in watercolor. And we're getting these wonderful effects. And the presses came along and said, hey, you know, we want more of an immediacy. We want to have more of an impression of the scene. And you can't do that by sitting there for six months with an easel in a street set up, you know, working for it, you know, over months and months and months. Instead, we're going to leave the brushwork more broken, more, you know, a little more chaotic because you have to put it down much more quickly. But because you're actually doing that, you're trying to capture a moment, you're, it's actually going to feel more like a moment. It's not going to feel like this super, you know, um, controlled sort of painting and so that's what they were that was part of the, that was the point with which they were trying to, to convey to the viewer was that this was a passing moment that if they blinked all the little bits and checks and marks you know might disappear just like the moment they're viewing and it also conveyed a lot more energy and all these other things so really great stuff and anyone who's seen like a John Singer Sargent painting or something, uh, you know, he was doing portraiture and he would still work on things for quite some time in studio, but he would, um, you yeah, know, that would have areas of very, um, it looked like he was just slapped it down called bravura, meaning you're leaving the brush stroke. You don't mess with it. You put it down, you leave it. 
But what most people don't know is that he would sometimes put a stroke down 13, 14, 15 times, scrape it, do it again, scrape it, do it again, scrape until he got just the right stroke. And that's what many people don't understand about Sargent. It wasn't that he just sat down. And of course he did hundreds of hours of painting. So he had lots of time on the brush, as people would say, you know, he was really a, a master of brushmanship. But when you're doing it where all the brushwork has to look like it was seamless and easy, it's never easy or seamless to create that look. You're always going to have, you know, because you could have very easily a thousand brush strokes in a painting and not all thousand brush strokes are going to just magically look like, you know, you, you weren't, you know, just didn't, they fl flowed from you like the, you know, your creativity that was giving you a whatever. Um, that's hard to do. And so again, you'd put it down. If it didn't work, you'd scrape it and you'd do it again until the whole painting looked like every stroke was very determined, confident, and was done in just one stroke, but in fact it wasn't. So anyways, we got off on the impressions, but so now we've got, uh, again, we've got a gradation here in our, in our cast shadow. Got some, uh, what looks to be, what might be pluming over here, so I'm going to see if I can. This is also breaking outside of the original rectangle. The original rectangle was right down through here. But again, if I if you're gonna again map this, map that out, no one will ever know. I'm gonna leave this. Uh, this is the white tablecloth. Now, if I was gonna actually do this, I'd probably glaze sort of a blue green because it has a little yellow to it, so it'll seem warmer. And then come forward to where I might have you know washes a very light pink to get a little bit you know of the uh, sort of the the vibrancy of the white, but you have to make sure you don't make that too dark. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to let this dry though. We're going to come back and we're just going to finish this up. But again, this is the whole concept of, and I don't know if the, the um, camera picks it up, but with, with this we get bits of red, we get bits where it was yellower, uh, bits of the original green and blue showing through, and so you get this vibration of color that you can't get any other way except by glazing complements into your, you know, into your working areas. And it's a really great way of working. And it gives a nice consistency or what we call color structure to the whole thing. And so we're gonna continue on with this, get this finished off. And uh, I'll, we'll just see you in a few minutes. All right, so we're back. So we did again the cast shadow here. We've done the background. We're gonna go ahead and just try to finish out some things on the pair. I think first off, I glazed this, um, stem with a little bit of green because usually I use a lot of sort of earthy tones which are little you know or yellows or reds or oranges is what browns are and so we're going to go ahead and bring I think a little bit of the violet I think that'll be nice again to give a little bit of color contrast uh, one color with another I'm gonna just soften it by putting some water next to that and let it bleed a little bit okay and uh, we're gonna go ahead and let that dry and we're gonna come back we're gonna do this and we're gonna finish with the step all right, so we're going to just go ahead and finish off our pair here. I'm going to go ahead and re-wet this pair. I'm, I'm using the, the brush almost parallel to the surface, so that way we don't have... I need a smaller brush to get in there. I've got a five round that I'm going to use. And I'm using the brush, again, almost parallel to the surface of the paper so that it, it doesn't cause as much friction. That way I have less chance of it picking up paint. I'm also trying to keep the brush very gently on the top of the water as it drags using the water tension again so I'm not dragging over the paint. So that way I don't, again, pick up 
any of the pigment that's down there. We, we don't want that. So we, we worked really hard to get this look that we've got here and we don't want to mess that up. So again, we're going to go ahead and come around here. And you see how the paint darkens as it gets wet. So again, there's that whole adage of if it's the color you want when it's wet, it won't be the color you want when it's dry because the colors look deeper when they're wet. Just like, you know, if a rock in a river or, you know, or a small creek bed, you looks so pretty and you pull it out and then it dries and it's very dull and gray. And you get it wet and it's all beautiful and deep and gorgeous colors and all this good stuff. Um, it's the same thing with the with the watercolor. Uh, some people will actually try to take watercolor and then they'll try to seal it after it's done to try to bring some of that back. Uh, most watercolors will just go ahead and go, look, I'm going to go ahead and make my colors more vibrant so when they dry down they'll be the colors I want so you know either there is no you know this is correct and that's wrong it's just whatever it takes to get that look now most watercolors again they're gonna go ahead and just darken the color they're gonna make the color a little richer so that by the time it dries it'll be what they're looking for because of the change in watercolor it's a little harder to match colors with the medium than it is with say like oil um, there's some other mediums, same thing. Acrylic can be very hard to match exact colors because of the way it darkens as it dries. This gets lighter and acrylic gets darker. And usually there's a lot of, what almost all water-based mediums have that in common, that they will change as they dry. They either darken or they lighten. Whether we're talking about gouache or casein or, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, watercolor, casein, gouache, egg tempera, those are the most classic normally that you'll hear about in terms of water-based mediums that, you know, of course, use water as their to thin them and make them work. I'm going to get this number five brush again just as a coat place where I want to make sure that I'm getting the, the water in just the right place. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and drop in some color. So we're going to go ahead on the darker side of this. Um, there we go. It gets a little bit greener, uh, slightly. And so again, we're gonna go ahead and, we all, it also gets a little darker. So we're gonna try to darken a little bit more for the shadows. Now I don't think that's gonna be enough because again, if that's the color I want, then that won't be the color it is when it's dry. So we're gonna darken this a little bit more as we're, as we're dealing with the, uh, the painting of the, of the pear. I'm going to start lighter and then go darker for the core shadow as needed. All that good stuff. You know, because with watercolor we go lighter and then go and build up darker. So again, that would be smart to do. It uh, would not be smart to do it any other way. Um, <laughs> uh, doesn't mean I hadn't tried it before, but it would be smart to... Go, low, go over the lighter bits and then darken for the darker bits. That would be the way we'd want to do this. And I also can't, you know, you, you can't take copious amounts of time. You've got to, you know, do this as quickly as you possibly can get as close as what you possibly can to what you want and then leave it alone. We're going to try to get just a little bit more um, in there I think. So let's see if we can darken just a little bit for the core shadow. 
bring that core shadow around just a bit and let that bleed out a little bit as this comes around it's going to warm up so we're going to get just a little bit more so for what we call a half tone or a dark half tone as this is coming around through here and we're just going to make it lighter and a little richer again as it comes around the corner of this pair um, let's see that's got some of that green from the Payne's gray that we had so we're going to take some of that out making the brush a little thirstier so it'll pull some of that out uh, this goes down into shadow in here and this right now looks like a horseshoe or an eye or something so so this is coming up and this is then getting you know coming into light value uh, there's a couple places where I actually get a little bit of a highlight so we're going to leave some of that and this is coming down this edge a little bit getting a little darker as it goes into this depression here and then we're going to see if we can pull out, because that seems a little too dark, right? So we're going to pull out just some of this on this side of it. So it has a dark side and a light side. This is the side facing the light. And the other side is not. That we just lightened. Let's see if we can float some color back in there. Uh, I've taken some, some of the moisture out. I'm trying to control the moisture of the brush. Um, as we're doing this, we don't want it to get too dark or anything like that. Um, we're going to go ahead and glaze up through here a little bit. Um, glaze a little bit more through here probably, just a scotch along there. We have the top of this has a pigmentation that goes a little more golden and you know uh, orange and we even, gonna, it has a little bit of the, some uh, some umber to it, or in other words, it's, it's, it's a it's a it's sort of a brown gold, and so we're gonna bring some of that in here. Um, there's a ridge line along here where again it's it's golden, but it's lighter. So we're gonna get some red, uh, get some of this yellow, a little more of the yellow. Okay, so we want some of that gold that's gonna shine. this at the back as this goes up into the light again it's gonna have just a little bit of you know some of that bright lovely color we're gonna go ahead and now darken a couple of areas on here again for the the gold that's getting going into shadow a little bit and darkening a little bit on us and going down into here and getting a little darker and and we're going to go ahead and transition the yellow a little bit so it kind of fades a little bit into the yellow so we're going to bring some of this down into here and some of this down here just a, just a bit like so that like so um, That's actually pulled some off. So I'm going to put some back down in there. As far as that goes. And again, we got a little bit up here up top where it goes inside on this side. It's actually, there's a little bit of a small depression where it goes a little darker.
Okay. Um. And it looks like we're getting pretty close to this. We're going to try to transition this just a bit through there. Uh, so my uh, semi wet stroke again. Remember, we're always trying to like I'm going to do a little bit of a, a dry brush because if it's even a semi wet, this is going to bleed or make a bloom. So we don't want that. Um, Go ahead and get this a little drier as it comes down. Like so. I think we might do another one that's almost like a dry brush, maybe just a bit. I think I'm going to bring a little bit of the violet in here, maybe. Let's see what that color is going to be. Nope, that's too, too earthy. So let's bring some of this in here. And we're going to go ahead and try to... There's a, a plane here that's a flat plane coming around that we want to have some of that. The fact that we have this plane here that's a little darker, sort of a dark middle value, if we will. Stroke that with a little bit of water, see if we can soften this up just a just a bit. Um, sort of the same thing happening up here. So we're gonna take some of this, take some of that, and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna try to give us a, just a nice stroke across there. Was didn't mean to blow out the the uh, highlight. So you can pull some of that back off a little bit. This does have some. Let's say wiggle room. That's not the word I'm thinking of, but you can work with it. Is what I was thinking of. Uh, it's not watercolor. Is not. It's got a reputation for not being very malleable, not being very workable, and that's not exactly true. It's just you have to know how to work it, and if you know how to work it, you're not going to have a problem with it. Okay. Um, at this point, I think. Let's see, maybe we'll do one more of these. Because this is going to be right behind there. That's a swell. And that's coming up the hill a little bit. Uh, we're going to try to transition this because now this is popping a little bit too much. And then we're going to try to pull just a little bit of this out just to scotch to make that a little softer transition as far as that goes. I think we're going to try to shift the hue of the, the, the yellow just very quickly and see if we can get just a little bit more out of that. So this is changing hue a little bit, but it's also cha so it's changing value slightly and a little bit with the color. Now that was, again, a little on the dark side, so we're going to get with this uh, almost like a dry brush. So there's still water in it, but not much, and we're going to stroke the edge. Like so. I might even come in here and go, well, I think that was a little strong in a couple places. So I might blot it just a bit. Okay. Um, just to scotch more. See if we can put just a little bit into here. Now that's dry brushed. I'm going to go ahead and get just a little bit of a... a again, the, the, the brush, when you say dry brush, it's still a little wet, but not much. Put that in there. i to try to get just a little bit of a, of a swell. As it comes up, let's again have this start to get a little bit lighter um, and a little bit more intense as it's coming up and going over the hill, so to speak. Um, on this side, we're going to have it go down the hill just a bit. Now, it can't be too dark for this or it'll pop it too much. But we're going to see if we can get just a little bit of a bright color just on that other side, just a bit. It still looks like a D, uh, which 
There's some things where you're like, well, this is what's actually happening, but this is what I'm going to do. Um, we're at this point. This is what's actually happening, but we're going to soften this. I'm going to open that up a bit, and the way I'm going to do it, I think I'll use a smaller brush, is we're going to put a little bit more paint and, so, and make this, whoops, that's probably a little bit too dark. Um, soften this light through here so it's not as light as bright um, so that way your eye can come out of there a little bit um, easier there might even be some place where I need to do that over here where this again there's an edge where this comes over a little bit and that will help break the ring up and again if we break the ring up just a bit and it, it ha this is not, I'm making this up, this is observed, and I just hadn't put it in there yet. But even if I hadn't, there's a time where like, it's gotta come out of there. It's gotta flow back out and, and come back out again. And so I'm thinking structurally, what would have to happen with the planes? They would have to transition out of that. And if you're not careful, it will seem like that's contained, and you'll never get out of there, and it'll be kind of, uh, I don't want to say the Bermuda Triangle, but your eye will just, it'll just, it'll be a sore spot for your eye. And people won't be able to, you know, enjoy the other parts of your painting if they're stuck in this, in this little whirlpool, if you will. Um, that was too much. Pull that back down, soften that. Uh, we're getting some of the look that we're, uh, that I want. We're, I think we can soften just this into going into that light just a little bit more. Um, keep this, you know, and uh, again, just a little softer. That'll be a little softer. Um, maybe we'll bring some some of this yellow just a bit into there. Just 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 a just a dollop, just a little bit is what I meant by that. Um, pull this out just a little bit with a little bit of a wet brush and now for the most part I need to leave this alone um, this is probably fairly uh, dry up here so I'm going to go ahead and go into this for the um, the stem so I'm going to come in here now the stem's got some areas where we start to pick up now this is a uh, I'm using a, a pair that's actually faux painted uh, so the fact that I'm using a full painted pair, I've got some stuff that may or may not be accurate. But you know, a lot of times if we get the values right, it can seem very plausible, even though it's it's not exactly what happened up there. Artists will do that all the time. They use their quote unquote creative prerogative because they know that if they get it close enough, that the people will go, yeah, I'll buy that, sure. I, I, I think that's right. Uh, and the lucky thing is we're not dealing with, you know, this is not mathematics. We're not having to, you know, calculate the spacing between, you know, two gear points and how much, you know, precision you have to have between the gear points and the spacing or, you know, how little spacing. And this is much more simple. This is just we need to get it with enough value, dark side and a light side and enough of a color difference that the eye says, yeah, I think I've seen that before. It, it, it's it's relying on a memory and the good thing for the artist is that people uh, even with good memories have bad memories when it comes to objects and values and colors um, and so we have a lot of leeway as some people might say we have we have room for error and even though it may not be a hundred percent perfect and there's always error within a paint in a picture I mean but if you have an error of like 1 28th of an inch, no one's going to know it. If you And most people, you know, couldn't tell an error point of almost an eighth of an inch. So again, we have quite a bit of leeway. Um, when we first start drawing, though, we're lucky if we're even within a, you know, a quarter of an inch or sometimes even a half of an inch of where we need to be. And so that's when we get into trouble. But once you get used to dealing with proportion and once you get used to, to dealing with that aspect of things, everything else is it becomes much easier and as you start to understand how to use the eye and it's uh, what what it perceives the easier that we can create these illusions and that's what these are these are illusions and just like the, the you know the street magicians or whatever we're creating you know these these fun 
illusions for the eye for people to enjoy and, and, and in some cases to inspire you know, different you know, ways of thought or perhaps covering things in a way, uh, something dear to us in a way that might make people think of it in a way that hadn't been thought before. So sure, there certainly is that part of it, but again, we're, cre we're, we're creating a conversation with these visual ideas and tools in, in, a, in a particular way of the way we perceive things by sight and by the way we we put shapes together for those that are into more sort of abstract sorts of art and things like that. They're still dealing with those abstract concepts, but they're still trying to make a connection with the viewer, you know, uh, and we want that. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to have the viewer go, wow, that's, that's, this is amazing because of A, B, C, or D, you know, that, that they go, that, that they've been touched, that they've been made aware of something. Even if it's something as simple as how beautiful is a piece of fruit? I don't know the exact, uh, you know, poets will talk about, you know, the amazingness of, of one particular little object in the world and how within that particular object is contained ideas far beyond itself, you know, ideas of creation or ideas of the universe and things like that. And there certainly have been people that have, wonderful poets that have said that quite beautifully in a way that I, I, can't, I can't convey, but it, uh, if I have a good day and my painting is going well, I can convey it through my painting. And that's, that's the good news, is that you can convey all kinds of stuff visually, just like other people can do with the written word, like other people can do with theater and photography and other things. Um, so we've got this area where I broke outside the line. Now again, you want to do this once this is super dry. And uh, it's not super dry right now, but I'm going to see if I can get away with this. Uh, fingers crossed. you got to be careful if you ever pull this, if you ever try this, because again, once you, once you are if you screw it up, it's done. There's there's no going back. Uh, and so I'm going to come back. I'm going to grab a razor blade. And I'm going to show you me scraping this area right All here. All right, we're back. So we'll let this dry just a few minutes. So sometimes when we have stuff like this little part that came outside, sometimes people don't know what to do with that. And you can, once this is dried down, And as long as you're careful with this, now I've got this razor blade almost parallel to the surface of the paper. Um, and sometimes people are like, well, if you're going to paint that white cloth, isn't this going to destroy it? Well, not if I'm, as long as I'm gentle with this, I can take all that paint back off the surface and scrape it off. And if you've got a nice paper, like this is, this is 140 pound. I mean, it says it's 300 pound, but this is it's out of a it's out of a uh, a block, and it's not. First off, it's not as thick as 300 pound, um, and it's about a, it's just a little thicker than 140. So, for all intents and purposes, but if I've got 140 pound paper and above, well, again, as long as you're careful, this this paper can take quite a bit of of working. You know, I can, you know, I could take that out and then I can paint this area. Okay, so that's the other thing that sometimes people don't know. Oh, shoot, now what do I do? And you got options. Now I can even take an eraser. Now this is a kneaded eraser. Usually people use this for, for, uh, for drawing. You know, you can stretch it and put it back together as you, as you stretch this. It's just a kneaded eraser. Um, this is going to be a little more aggressive, so I was going to use this, um, and I can manipulate this into little thin blades and, and points and stuff. I could come back here and I could, you know, try to race off some stuff there. If I thought that perhaps there was a little a ridge here that kind of got, you know, filled in, I could, you know, try to scrape back. 
for just a little bit. Uh, you know, just a, you don't you're obviously not going to do you don't want to do major areas like this, but for little highlights and stuff like that, like let's say my highlight got blown out here again, I could scrape for the highlight. So I'm just using a, a um, just an, a razor blade. This isn't a sharper one would be better. Unfortunately, it's a little dull. The duller one's going to rip up the paper more. Use a sharper one. Don't do this. Uh, if you want really nice, uh, a lot more control, you can use an X-Acto knife. An X-Acto knife, for those who haven't seen them, they're, they're about yay long, and it's, it's made out of metal, and there's a little ring at the end that you, that you can loosen up. It, it twists, unscrews, and you put just a little tiny blade in there that comes to a point. It's very nice, and you can you know do some really fine detail stuff with that. You can with this, too. I kind of like these because I can, uh, in some ways, I feel I have just as much control. Um, but either one will work and work really well. You can also again use, uh, if I blew this out and again, I, I didn't, the scraping it was not working. I could get like a little electric eraser. You can buy them for like 13 bucks, battery powered. And they have like these white rubber in them. And you can go zip, 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 zip. And, and very quickly by erasing it, zip, zip, it'll start to make it lighter and lighter. Uh, and because it's the electric ones, you can actually rub away to, to the next layer of paper. You could bring it all the way to white if you wanted to. So that's a way again of, of uh, taking your your uh, painting to the next level. Now again, we're even though we're an intermediate, we're not doing rendering or things like that. But let's say we did. Let's say we said, oh, now there's spots on here. I've got all the different form shadows, but now I want spots. Well, then I would get a brush and I would dry brush um, little little points. You know, you could start to really manipulate it, and so it can become really powerful. So go ahead and try this at home where we're going to glaze with complementary colors and then come back over it with uh, the, the colors that we are, we planned on using to begin with. Again, it can really give us some, some very nice uh, variations uh, of that color as it goes from cooler to warmer and, and so forth and so on. So again, this has been Kevin McCain with Idaho Art Classes and Kevin McCain Studios. Give this a try, you know, give this a try and you guys have yourselves a good afternoon.